with the other two days, not only is the amphitheater filled to overflowing, but the rear of the amphitheater is also filled to overflowing. Previous days there have been 3,000, 2,500 students. Today there must be 5,000 and more waiting to hear the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. in this the third day of Civil Rights Week, a resolution proclamation by the University of Hawaii students. The Civil Rights Week program in connection with National Brotherhood Week was proclaimed in a resolution by President Tom Hamilton of the University of Hawaii in conjunction with the Associated Students of the University of Hawaii. They in turn have appointed a Civil Rights Week committee chairman by Simeon Akoba. Today the, the presidings will be handled by Glenn Izutsu, a member of the Civil Rights Committee. The Reverend Martin Luther King is already present. Mr. Izutsu is standing at the podium and waiting his appearance uh, on the stand. Students are still piling in. Uh, the entrances all over are filled to overflowing with people coming in. The entrances to the university grounds are jam-packed with cars as the Reverend King Jr. will be addressing this assemblage. The first day of Civil Rights Week was observed with the speaker, the head of the Black Muslims, the National Secretary, Mr. John Ali. Yesterday, James Farmer of the Congress of Racial Equality was the speaker, and today he will be followed by the Reverend Martin Luther King, the two acknowledged leaders of the Negro Revolution in America. Tomorrow, the fourth and last speaker to talk to the students at the university will be Mr. W.J. Simmons, who is the head of the White Citizens Council. The crowd is still piling in here, and once again, the TV newsreel cameras, the radio men, and the newspaper reporters are here in force. Pronouncements by Reverend Martin Luther King in connection with civil rights, of course, mean national news coverage as the leader of the non-violent movement for civil rights in America. Reverend King is a newsworthy figure on a national and an international basis. Most newsmen feel that the civil rights issue in the Negro Revolution is the single most important issue facing the people of the United States of America today. It's also the single most important piece of communist propaganda ammunition offered to the communists by the people of America when they refuse, of course, to recognize the rights of people anywhere, be they Negroes or Chinese or Indians or whatever. So today's meeting with the... Well, you could if you had as much guts as I do. I thought I could too. <laughs> I was good over there. There you are. It's now it's I have your attention. It's that simple. I ask There's for indulgence Susu. for our inadequate facilities today. I hope you will cooperate with us. I'm asking that you be considerate of the other people in the hall, in the amphitheater today. And I ask all of you back here that this aisle be left free at the conclusion of the lecture today. So, ask you so on this questions. note, I would like to welcome all of you on behalf of the Symposia Committee, which is sponsoring this series of lectures. This is the second in this series for this semester. Although this is an integral part of that series, this is indeed a momentous occasion because of the mag magnitude of today's speaker. Before I begin, I would like to introduce Mr. Gary Yamagata, President of the Associated Students of the University of Hawaii. Mr. Yamagata doesn't seem to be immediately forthcoming. Oh, he's coming down from far to the rear of the amphitheater platform. Mr. Uh, Mitsu. This lecture today marks the last appearance in Hawaii for our speaker. President of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Time Magazine's Man of the Year, and the man who has dedicated his life racial equality in the United States, I would like to present to you this afternoon the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr.
tremendous ovation here at Andrews Amphitheater for the man and what he represents. All of the persons assembled in the amphitheater are now standing as they applaud and await the arrival on the podium of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. If you tuned in late, it's a beautiful day here on the Manoa campus. The sun is shining. There are well over 5,000 students and other persons waiting to hear the first words of Dr. Martin Luther King. Mr. Izutsu, members of the faculty and members of the student body of this great institution of learning, ladies and gentlemen, I am certainly delighted to have the opportunity and the privilege of being on the campus of the University of Hawaii and the privilege of returning once more to this beautiful island and to this great state of our nation. I always come here with a deep sense of appreciation and I'm always deeply moved by the warmth, by the expressions of love and the gentle sweetness of the people of this state. I bring you greetings from your fellow citizens of the mainland, and I can assure you that we are deeply grateful for the support that you give in the struggle for freedom and human dignity taking place all over our nation. I always consider it a rich and rewarding experience when I can take just a brief break from the day-to-day -day demands of our struggle and discuss the issues involved in that struggle with college and university students. And so I can assure you that it is a pleasure to be here. I would like to use as a subject from which to speak this afternoon progress toward desegregation. And I think there are three basic positions that can be taken toward the whole question of progress in the area of race relations. First, that is the position of extreme optimism. The extreme optimists would contend that we have made marvelous strides in human relations. He would point proudly to the progress that has been made over the last few decades. And from this, he would conclude that the problem is just about solved now and that we can sit down comfortably by the wayside and wait on the coming of the inevitable. The second attitude that can be taken is that of extreme pessimism. The extreme pessimist would contend that we've made only minor strides in the area of race relations. He would argue that the deep rumblings of discontent in our nation, the pre presence of federal troops in Little Rock, Arkansas, Oxford, Mississippi, or Tuscaloosa, Alabama, the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan, and the birth of white citizens' councils are all indicative of the fact that we are going backwards instead of forward. And from this, the extreme pessimist would conclude that the problems in human relations cannot really be solved because human nature can't be changed. Now, it is very interesting to notice that the extreme optimist 
and the extreme pessimists agree on at least one point. They both feel that we should sit down and do nothing in the area of race relations. The extreme optimist says do nothing because integration is inevitable. The extreme pessimist says do nothing because integration is impossible. But that is a third position that can be taken, namely the realistic position. The realists in the area of race relations would seek to balance the truths of two opposites while avoiding the extremes of both. So he would agree with the optimist that we have come a long, long way, but he would have to balance that by agreeing with the pessimist that we have a long, long way to go before the problem is solved. And it is this realistic position that I would like to use as a basis for our thinking together this afternoon as we think about progress toward desegregation progress toward making the American dream a reality. We have come a long, long way, but we have a long, long way to go before the problem is solved. Let us notice first that we've come a long, long way. And I'd like to point out that the Negro himself has come a long, long way in re-evaluating his own intrinsic worth. In order to illustrate this, a bit of history is necessary. You will remember that it was in the year of 1619 when the first Negro slaves landed on the shores of this nation. They were brought here from the soils of Africa. Unlike the Pilgrim Fathers who landed at Plymouth a year later, they were brought here against their will. And throughout slavery, the Negro was treated in a very inhuman fashion. He was a thing to be used, not a person to be respected. He was merely a depersonalized cog in a vast plantation machine. The famous Dred Scott decision of 1857 well illustrated the status of the Negro during slavery. In this decision, the Supreme Court of our nation said in substance that the Negro is not a citizen of the United States. He is merely property subject to the dictates of his owner. And it went on to say that the Negro has no rights that the white man is bound to respect living with the system of slavery and then later segregation, many Negroes lost faith in themselves. Many came to feel that perhaps they were less than human, perhaps they were inferior. But then something happened to the Negro. Circumstances made it possible and necessary for him to travel more. The coming of the automobile, the upheaval to two world wars, the Great Depression. And so his rural plantation background gradually gave way to urban industrial life. And even his economic life was rising through the growth of industry, organized, labor, expanded educational opportunities. And even his cultural life was rising through the steady decline of crippling illiteracy. All of these forces conjoined to cause the Negro to take a new look at himself. Negro masses all over began to re-evaluate themselves. The Negro came to feel that he was somebody. His religion revealed to him that God loves all of his children and that all men are made in his image. And figuratively speaking, every man from a base black to a treble white is significant on God's keyboard. And so the Negro could now unconsciously cry out with the eloquent poet, fleecy locks and black complexion cannot forfeit nature's claim. 
Skin may differ, but affection dwells in black and white the same. Were I so tall as to reach the pole, or to grasp the ocean at a span, I must be measured by my soul. The mind is a standard of the man. With this new sense of dignity, this new sense of self-respect, a new Negro came into being with a new determination to suffer, to struggle, to sacrifice, and even die if necessary in order to be free. And so in a real sense, we have come a long, long way since 1619. But not only that, the whole nation has made significant strides in extending the frontiers of civil rights. Fifty years ago, even thirty years ago, a year hardly passed when numerous Negroes were not viciously lynched in the South by some brutal mob. Lynchings have about ceased today. This represents progress. There was a time when most of the states in the South used various conniving methods to keep Negroes from becoming registered voters. And one of the methods used was the poll tax. But now the poll tax has been eliminated in all but four states in state elections. And with the recent vote of the legislature of the state of South Dakota, a new amendment has come into being to the Constitution outlawing the poll tax in federal elections. At the turn of the century, there were very few Negroes registered to vote in the southern part of the United States. But we've seen even a little progress there. By 1948, that number had leaped 750,000. By 1960, it had leaped to a million three hundred thousand. And today, there are approximately two million Negroes registered to vote in the South. This represents some progress. When we turn to economic justice, we see some strides. The average Negro wage earner of today earns 12 times more than the average Negro wage earned of 10 years ago. And the national income of the Negro is now more than $27 billion a year, which is more than all of the exports of the United States and more than the national budget of Canada. This represents some progress. But probably more than anything else, we have seen the barriers of legal segregation gradually crumble in our nation. We remember the history of segregation. It had its legal beginning in 1896 when the Supreme Court of the nation rendered a decision known as the Plessy versus Ferguson decision which established the doctrine of separate but equal as the law of the land. But as a result of the separate but equal doctrine, there was always a strict enforcement of the separate without the slightest intention of abiding by the equal. And the Negro ended up being plunged into the abyss of exploitation, where he experienced the bleakness of nagging injustice. Then in 1954, the Supreme Court of the nation rendered another decision. It examined the legal body of segregation, and on May 17th of that year, it pronounced it constitutionally dead. It said in substance that the old Plessy Doctrine must go, that separate facilities are inherently unequal, and that to segregate a child on the basis of his race is to deny that child equal protection of the law. And as a result of this decision, we have seen many significant developments. To put it figuratively in biblical language, we have broken loose from the Egypt of slavery 
We have moved through the wilderness of legal segregation, and now we stand on the border of the promised land of integration. And in a real sense, the system of segregation is on its deathbed today, and the only thing uncertain about it is how costly the segregationists will make the funeral. The old order of segregation is passing away, and we've come a long, long way since 1896. Now, this would be a wonderful place for me to end my lecture. First, it would mean making a short speech, and this would be a magnificent accomplishment for a Baptist preacher. <laughs> the second, it would mean that the problem is about solved now. It would be a wonderful thing if speakers all over our country could talk about this problem as a problem that once existed, but that no longer has existence. But you see, if I stopped at this point, I would merely be stating a fact and not telling the truth. You see, a fact is merely the absence of contradiction, but truth is the presence of coherence. Truth is the relatedness of facts. Now, it is a fact that we've come a long, long way, but it isn't the whole truth. And if I stop here, I'm afraid that I will leave you the victims of a dangerous optimism. If I stop at this point, I may leave you the victims of an illusion wrapped in superficiality. So in order to tell the truth, it's necessary to move on. Not only say that we've come a long, long way, but we have a long, long way to go before this problem is solved in our nation. Now, we don't have to look very far to see that. We just need to open our newspapers or turn on our televisions and look around and we see that the problem is still with us. There are still states in our union with our legislative halls ringing with such words as interposition and nullification. I mentioned the fact that lynchings have about ceased, but other things are happening in terms of open murder. We can still hear the voice of a Medgar Evers in Jackson, Mississippi, Sippy, being shot by some vicious person who shoots him simply because he stands up for basic constitutional rights. We can still think of a dark Sunday morning last September, where four beautiful, unoffending, innocent girls were lit or murdered and killed in a church in Birmingham, Alabama. We can still see communities where churches are actually burned down because the worshipers of those churches are concerned about being registered voters. This reveals that we have a long, long way to go. I mentioned that we made strides in getting Negroes registered to vote in the South. I mentioned the figure of about two million registered voters. That is the other side. There are still some 10 million Negroes who live in the southern part of the United States. And about six million are eligible to vote. That is, they are voting age. And only about two million are registered. And many of these people, these four million who are not registered, are not registered because all types of conniving methods are being used to keep them from voting as citizens. In some places, economic reprisals are taken out against them if they seek to register. In some places, outright Violence is taken out against them if they seek to register. In some situations, complex literacy tests are given with questions so difficult that a person with a Ph.D. degree or a law degree from the finest law school in the country couldn't answer to the even more difficult question, how many bubbles do you find in a bar of soap? And they tell me that occasionally they ask questions like that in Alabama and Mississippi when Negroes go to register and vote. This reveals that we have a long, long way to go. I mentioned economic justice and I gave a big figure, some $27 billion as the annual income of the Negro. 
Let us look at the other side. That is that 42% of the Negro families of America still earn less than $2,000 a year, while just 17% of the white families earn less than $2,000 a year. 20% of the Negro families of America earn less than $1,000 a year, while just 5% of the white families earn less than $1,000 a year. 88% of the Negro families in America still earn less than $5,000 a year, while just 58% of the white families earn less than $5,000 a year. This problem must be solved, this economic gap, these problems of economic injustice. And in these days of automation, the problem is getting even more difficult because of discrimination, because of a lack of apprenticeship training, discrimination in this area, because of a lack of educational opportunities. Negroes, by and large, in the states have been limited to unskilled and semi-skilled labor. These are the jobs that are now passing away in these days of automation. And so the Negro looks up in a city like Detroit, where he's 28% of the population, and yet some 70% of the unemployed. And this problem is growing every day. It means that the nation will have to do something in terms of vigorous retraining programs, in terms of vigorous work to wipe out poverty, in terms of vigorous work to make employment discrimination something that passes away. We do have a long, long way to go before economic justice is a reality. And I must also mention that we have a long, long way to go before the barriers of racial segregation are completely broken down. Certainly we've made strides in this area, but we must still face the fact and in many communities in the South, that is outright legal segregation. There are still places where a Negro cannot sit down and get a cup of coffee or a hamburger at a lunch counter. There are still places where a Negro can be traveling and yet he cannot get a hotel room or a motel room. There are still places where Negroes confront segregation in public accommodations then that is the de facto segregation of the North. So it may be true, as I said, uh, figuratively speaking, that old man segregation is on his deathbed. But history has proven that social systems have a great last-minute breathing power. And the guardians of the status quo are always on hand with their oxygen tents to keep the old order alive. And so we still have segregation in its glaring and conspicuous forms in the South and in its hidden and subtle forms in the North. But if democracy is to live, segregation must die. Segregation is a cancer in the body politic which must be removed before our moral and democratic health can be realized. And we don't have long to do it. I know there are those cautious individuals who are always saying, slow up, who are always saying you're pushing things too fast, who are always saying you should cool off. They are saying adopt a policy of moderation. As I have said so often, if moderation means moving on toward the goal of justice with wise restraint and calm reasonableness, then moderation is a great virtue which all men of goodwill must seek to achieve during this tense period of transition. But if moderation means slowing up in the move for justice and capitulating to the undemocratic practices of the guardians of a deadening status quo, then moderation is a tragic vice which all men of goodwill must condemn. We can't afford to slow up. We have our self-respect to maintain, but because of our love for America, we can't afford to slow up. There are some three billion people in this world. The vast majority of these people live in Asia and Africa. For years, most of the peoples of these continents have been dominated politically. 
regarded economically segregated and humiliated by some foreign power. But today they are gaining their independence. It's moving at a sort of jet-like pace. Thirty years ago, there were only three independent countries in the whole of Africa. I remember when Mrs. King and I went to attend the independent celebration of Ghana back in 1957. We were happy about the fact that there were now eight independent countries in Africa. But since that night in March 1957, some 27 new independent countries have come into being in Africa alone. And as these nations in Africa and Asia gain their independence, they are saying in no uncertain terms that racism and colonialism must go. And they are saying that they will not respect any nation that will subject a segment of its citizenry on the basis of race or color. And so the hour is late. The clock of destiny is ticking out. And we must move on and solve this problem before it is too late. I must reiterate that, as I said to an audience last night, that we must not seek to solve this problem merely to appeal to Asian and African peoples. This isn't the basic reason why the problem should be solved. We must not solve this problem to meet the communist challenge. This isn't the basic reason that it should be solved. We must seek to uproot discrimination and segregation from American society because they are morally wrong. We must get rid of segregation because it is an evil system, because it is sinful. This job must be done, not merely because it is diplomatically expedient, but because it is morally compelling. So the great challenge ahead is to move with vigor, to move with determination, to solve this problem that is such a crucial problem in our nation. Now, I would like to suggest some of the things that must be done in order to solve this problem. First, I'd like to mention the role of the federal government. Certainly, if the problem is to be solved, the federal government must take a forthright stand, making it clear that the national policy is one of integration and one of brotherhood. And it must set out to enforce the law. Now we must get rid of one or two myths that are constantly disseminated if the federal government is to carry out its responsibilities. One is a myth of time. I'm sure you've heard this argument. It is the argument that only time can solve the problem. And so the individuals who follow this myth will say to Negroes and their allies in the white community, don't push too hard, just be nice and patient and continue to pray and the problem will work itself out in 100 or 200 years. This is a myth of time. Well, the only answer that we can give to this myth is that time is neutral. It can be used either constructively or destructively. And I'm absolutely convinced that the people of ill will in our nation have often used time much more effectively than the people of good will. And it may well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the bitter words and the violent actions of the bad people who will bomb a church in Birmingham, Alabama, but for the appalling silence of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Somewhere we must come to see human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. Evolution may be true in the biological realm, and at that point Darwin is right. But when a Herbert Spencer seeks to apply to the whole of society, there is very little evidence for it. Somewhere we must see that human progress comes into being through the persistent work and the tireless effort of dedicated individuals who are willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. And so we must see the necessity of using time creatively. And we must recognize that the time is always right 
to do right. Now the other myth that is often circulated is the idea that legislation cannot solve the problems that we face in human relations. You've got to change the heart to solve these problems. And this cannot be done through legislation. It must be done by religion and it must be done by education. Now certainly a half truth is involved here. The problem is finally to be solved. Attitudes must change and we must come to see that religion and education will have a great role to play in changing attitudes. So it may be true that Morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. It may be true that the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. It may be true that the law can make a man love me, but it can keep him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important also. <laughs> In other words, And so we will need religion and education to change bad internal attitudes, but we need legislation to control the external effects of those bad internal attitudes. It may be true that we cannot legislate integration because integration is mutual acceptance. Integration deals in the realm of attitudes, but we can legislate desegregation, and desegregation is a necessary first step toward an integrated society. And so I submit to you that that is a need now, strong civil rights legislation. You well know that that is a debate in our Congress at the present time, dealing with the civil rights bill. Several months ago, a young, vigorous, intelligent, sincere president stood before our nation and said in eloquent terms the problems that we face in the realm of human relations are not merely political problems, they are not merely economic problems, they are not merely sociological problems. The issue is at bottom a moral issue. And he went on to say it is as old as the scriptures and as modern as the constitution. It is a question of whether you will treat your neighbors as you would like to be treated. And on the heels of this great speech, he offered to the Senate, I mean to the Congress of our nation, the most comprehensive package of civil rights legislation ever presented by any president in the history of our nation. Since he made that speech and presented that civil rights package, our nation has known a dark day and a dreary night. He was cut down by an assassin's bullet on Elm Street in Dallas, Texas. And I think that the greatest tribute that the United States of America can pay the late President Kennedy is to pass that civil rights bill as it stands in its present form without watering it down at any point. <laughs> now I must remind you that there are determined forces seeking to water the bill down. The Southern Senators have concluded that there will be a civil rights bill this year. But their aim is to emasculate that bill to the point that it will have no teeth, it will have no meaning. And they will try to water down or take out the public accommodation section, the section dealing with fair employment. They will use the filibuster method to do it. They will seek to develop the same coalition that has served as the legislative incinerator that has burned to ashes every significant move in civil rights in the past years. And the people of this nation must not allow that to happen. And I hope that all of the people of goodwill will mobilize 
engage in the kind of creative lobbying and the kind of direct action that will keep this issue before the forefront of the conscience of the nation. And I think everybody ought to take just a few minutes to write the key senators who can play such an important role in getting this bill through Congress. Legislation is important, and I feel that this legislation is so important that if it isn't passed, a discontent, a frustration, and a despair will develop in the Negro community that will lead to a great deal of social disruption and will make it much more difficult for the responsible leaders in the Negro community to keep the activities within the disciplined path. And so I think we owe it to the nation. I think we owe it to democracy. I think we owe it to God to see that this civil rights legislation is passed. And so the federal government has a great role to play, and every citizen of this nation has a role to play in urging the federal government to play its role. But I would not like to leave you with the impression that the whole job must be done by somebody else. We are absolutely convinced that if this problem is to be solved, those who are the victims of the system must do something about it. In other words, the Negro must do something himself to make his citizenship rights a reality. And this is what we've tried to stress in our movement that has taken place now all over this country, both North and South. We've tried to say that freedom is not some lavish dish that the federal government will pass out on a silver platter while the Negro merely furnishes the appetite. If we are to gain our freedom, we must work for it. And so we are working in the various civil rights organizations through the courts, we are working to double the number of Negro registered voters. We are working through selective buying programs, trying to get industries to come in line and adopt policies of non-discrimination. We are working in each state to bring about the proper legislation to deal with the problems of housing discrimination and employment discrimination and segregation in the schools. Along with all of this, we are supplementing what we do through what we refer to as nonviolent direct action. Now, I would like to say just a word about nonviolence since this forms such a basic part of our movement. And I'm happy to say that the movement, by and large, has been nonviolent. The demonstrators have been amazingly nonviolent. And whenever violence has occurred, it has usually come from the other side, not from the demonstrators. The demonstrators have been willing to accept blows without retaliating. Now that is power in this method. First, it has a way of disarming the opponent. It exposes his moral defenses, it weakens his morale, and at the same time, it works on his conscience. This is a power of nonviolence. And so the opponent just doesn't know how to deal with it. I can remember in Birmingham, Alabama, when we were in the struggle there last summer, there was a man named Bull Connor. You may have read of him out this way. He was a police commissioner. And Bull Connor had thrived for years, making the Negro issue the issue of exploitation and oppression. And he had been brutal and vicious in all of his dealings with Negroes. And when the movement started last summer, he was frustrated. He didn't quite know what to do. And Bull Connor was always happy when some of the spectators on the sideline would throw bricks, when some of the, the Negroes who had gotten disgusted would throw bricks. He was always very happy. But when Bull Connor had to confront hundreds and thousands of Negro boys and girls, Negro men and women, marching quietly with discipline down the streets of Birmingham, singing with dignity, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, and we shall overcome. And then as he would throw them in the paddy wagons, they would get in, 
singing, woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. And there was something about this that frustrated Bull Connor. He didn't know how to handle it. And that same Birmingham that Bull Connor said would never be integrated now has to face the fact that it has integrated lunch counters and other integrated facilities that officials were saying just eight months ago would never be integrated. This is a powerful method. It exposes the moral defenses and weakens the morale of the opponent. If he doesn't beat you, wonderful. If he beats you, you develop the quiet courage of accepting blows without retaliating. If he doesn't put you in jail, wonderful. Nobody with any sense loves to go to jail. But if he puts you in jail, you go in that jail and transform it from a dungeon of shame to a haven of freedom and human dignity. Even if he tries to kill you, you develop the inner conviction that that is something so dear, something so worthful, something so eternally true that they're worth dying for. If an individual has not discovered something that he will die for, he isn't fit to live. This is what the nonviolent discipline says, and that is power in it. It is the most potent weapon, I am convinced, available to oppress people in their struggle for freedom. Another thing about this method is that it makes it possible for individuals to struggle to secure moral ends through moral means. One of the big, great debates of history has been over the whole question of ends and means. And there have been those who have argued that the end justifies the means. Sometimes whole systems of government argue this. I think this is one of the great tragedies of communism, that in its theoretical system it says so often that the end justifies the means and any method is all right to bring about the goal of the classless society. This is where the nonviolent movement would break with communism or any other system that argues that the end justifies the means because the end is pre-existent in the means and the means represent the ideal in the making and the end in process. It is just as important to be concerned about the means you use as it is to be concerned about the end you seek. And so in the nonviolent movement, we use nonviolence as a means because our concern is to bring about the end of the beloved community. And we don't believe that this end can be brought about through violence. And then another thing about this method, it makes it possible for the individual to struggle against an unjust system, to resist it with all of his might, it may mean sit-ins, it may mean wait-ins or stand-ins, it may mean picketing, it may mean boycotting, all of these forms of resistance. But in the process, you never stoop to violence or hatred. It says that the love ethic can stand at the center of the movement. Now, whenever I talk about this, people began to raise questions. What do you mean when you say love those people who are bombing your home and love those people who are oppressing you and seeking to hold you down. How can you love them? And I must always go on to say that I'm not talking about emotional bosh. I'm not talking about a sentimental emotion. I think it is nonsense to urge oppressed people to love their violent oppressors in an affectionate sense. This, this would never be. And I'm thankful that the Greek language comes to our aid as we try to explain the meaning of love in this area. You know, there are three words in the Greek language for love. One is the word eros. Eros is a sort of aesthetic love. Plato talked about it a great deal in his dialogues, the yearning of the soul for the realm of the divine. It has come to us to be a sort of romantic love. And so in this sense, we all know about eros. We've We've uh, experienced it and we've read about it in all of the beauties of literature. In a sense, Edgar Allan Poe was talking about Eros when he talked about his beautiful Annabel Lee with a love surrounded by the halo of eternity. In a sense, Shakespeare was talking about Eros when he said, love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. It is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. It is a star to every wandering bark. You know, I can remember that because I used to quote it to my wife when we were courting. 
That's eros. The Greek language talks about phileo, which is another level of love. Phileo is a sort of intimate affection between personal friends. On this level, you love people that you like. This is the type of love you have for your roommate and your good friends. This is friendship. You love because you are loved. It is a sort of reciprocal relationship. Then the Greek language comes out with the word agape. Agape is more than romantic love. Agape is more than friendship. Agape is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. Theologians would say that it is the love of God operating in the human heart. It is an overflowing love that seeks nothing in return. And when you rise to love on this level, you love every man, not because you like him, not because his ways appeal to you, but you love him because God loves him. And you rise to the point of being able to love the person who does the evil deed while hating the deed that the person does. I think this is what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies, and I'm so happy he didn't say like your enemies. It's pretty difficult to like some people. I must honestly say that I find it pretty difficult to like Mr. Eastland and Thurman and to like the things they are doing to Negroes in the Senate and voting against this civil rights legislation. I find it difficult to like that, but Jesus says love them. And love is greater than like. Love is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. And I believe this is the kind of love that can lead us through this period of transition and bring us to that bright day when the brotherhood of man will be a reality. And I think it will help those of us who are struggling to break loose from this unjust system to go into the new age with the right attitude. We will not go in to retaliate or to pay our oppressors back for all of the injustices that they've heaped upon us for years. We will not seek to rise from a position of disadvantage to one of advantage, thereby subverting justice. We will not substitute one tyranny for another. I know there are some among us who, because of the long night of oppression, because of the injustices, because of the understandable discontent, have gotten bitter. They've come to conclude that there is no solution to the problem within. And so they talk about the Negro moving out into some separate state or some separate area. They talk in terms of a doctrine of black supremacy sometimes. But I am convinced that a doctrine of black supremacy is as dangerous as a doctrine of white supremacy. And God is not interested merely in the freedom of black men and brown men and yellow men, but God is interested in the freedom of the whole human race and the creation of a society where all men will live together as brothers and every man will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. And so if we will go on with this attitude, we can bring this day into being when the American dream will be a reality. We can go this additional distance that I talked about a few minutes ago. May I say to you that this problem must be the concern of every citizen of this nation. One does not have to live in Alabama to be concerned. One does not have to live in Mississippi to be concerned. One does not have to live in Georgia to be concerned. One may not live in the ghetto situations or the slum situations the Negroes face in some of the big cities like Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and other places. Wherever one lives in the United States, his freedom is threatened so long as any citizen of this nation is not free. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And this is why we are calling upon students and people of goodwill from all over the country this summer to come south to help us in counties and communities all over the Deep South to get Negroes out to register and vote. We are forming what we call a domestic freedom corps. And we hope that hundreds of students will take this as a great responsibility to come into the South and to go into the problem areas of our country, making it clear that we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny, and nobody will be free until all of God's children are free in this nation. 
In short, this problem will not be solved until that is a sort of divine discontent. You know, there are certain words within every academic discipline that soon become stereotypes and cliches. Modern psychology has a word that is probably used more than any other word in modern psychology. It is the word maladjusted. This word is a ringing cry of modern child of psychology. And certainly we all want to live the well-adjusted life in order to avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. But I must say to you, my friends, that there are some things in our social order and in the world to which I'm proud to be maladjusted, to which I hope all men of goodwill will be maladjusted until the good societies realize. I must say to you that I never intend to adjust myself to segregation and discrimination. I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few. I never intend to become adjusted to the madness of militarism and the self-defeating effects of physical violence. But in a day when Sputniks and explorers are dashing through outer space and guided ballistic missiles are carving highways of death through the stratosphere, no nation can win a war. It is no longer the choice between violence and nonviolence. It is either nonviolence or non-existence. And the alternative to disarmament, the alternative to the suspension of nuclear tests, the alternative to strengthening the United Nations and thereby disarming the whole world, may well be a civilization plunged into the abyss of annihilation. And so this is why I welcome the recent test ban treaty. There is a need, I'm sure, for a new organization in our world, the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. Men and women, <laughs> yes, men and women who will be as maladjusted as the prophet Amos, who in the midst of the injustices of his day, the crowd in words that echo across the centuries, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream, as maladjusted as Abraham Lincoln, who had the vision to see that this nation could not survive half slave and half free, as maladjusted as Thomas Jefferson, who in the midst of an age amazingly adjusted to slavery, could scratch across the pages of history words lifted to cosmic proportions, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Through such maladjustment, we will be able to emerge from the bleak and desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to man into the bright and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. This is our hope. May I say, I believe we will go that additional distance. I believe that somewhere deep down within our nation, that is a determination to move on in spite of the obstacles, in spite of the difficulties. And this is a faith that keeps us singing in our struggle, a song that has become our theme song. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. Before the victory is won, some more will get scarred up. Before the victory is won, some more will be thrown into jail. Before the victory is won, some more will be misunderstood and called bad names. But I am convinced that we shall overcome. And with this faith, we will be able to adjourn the councils of despair and bring new light into the dark chambers of pessimism. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of America into a creative psalm of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, brown men and yellow men, will be able to join hand in hands in the bond of brotherhood and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God. God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you.
Again, this time, as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. finishes his talk, the entire audience here at the Andrews Amphitheater has risen to its feet to applaud the end of his speech. You have been listening to Dr. King, who has been presented by the Associated Students of the University of Hawaii in observance of Civil Rights Week, the third in a series of four talks by leaders in the integration and segregation movements. Tomorrow, W.J. Simmons, the head of the White Citizens Council, will be the main speaker here at the Andrews Amphitheater. Time of the speech, 12 noon. It, too, will be broadcast live and direct by KGU at noontime to be repeated later in the evening. This broadcast has been arranged through the KGU Public Affairs Department. I would like to thank the students and the faculty of the University of Hawaii for making the broadcast possible. We return you now to the stations of the All Islands Radio Network.